once again to Show of the Week. I'm Jane. And I'm Mike, and this week I've been studying the Assassin's Creed Unity trailer for clues as to where it might be set. Feudal Japan, called it. What about the guillotine? It's a feudal Japanese guillotine, classic. Okay, while you were doing that, important work, I've been playing Bioshock Infinite's Burial at Sea, Episode 2. Is that the one set in World War One Russia? No, Mike, it really isn't. Burial at Sea is set in the underwater city of Rapture. And also Paris? Bonjour, Monsieur Surratt. <sighs> Bonjour, Mademoiselle Elisabeth. But mostly Rapture. This is the DLC follow-up to Bioshock Infinite that takes Booker and Elizabeth to the soggy city from the original Bioshock before it all fell apart. In this second and final episode of Burial at Sea, it's your turn to play as Elizabeth. The events of the first episode, which we won't give away here in case you have yet to catch up, leave Liz without her quantum superpowers. Now, without the ability to rip open portals in space-time, Elizabeth is just a book-smart dame marooned in rapture with mad lockpicking skills and chipped nail polish. And plasmids. And Burial at Sea's newfangled microwave ray gun. So she's not exactly helpless, but at the same time she is much more fragile than old bullet sponge Booker. This is one of the ways Burial at Sea steers you towards playing Elizabeth as a stealthy explorer, not a suicidal gunfighter. If you hadn't got the hint, there's also a new crossbow weapon with tranquilizer darts, sleeping gas darts and distracting noisemaker darts. Hint, hint. Your father's blood runs in your veins, but it doesn't have to be on your hands. And a new plasmid that turns you invisible and lets you see through walls. Not just because detective vision is trendy these days, but because you're trapped in Fontaine's department store with more splices than you can shake a syringe full of Adamat. <laughs> Elizabeth cuts a deal with revolutionary leader Atlas to free him and his men from that makeshift prison in return for Sally, the little girl Booker was searching for in the first episode of Burial at Sea. If you're lying, we can just as well kill you tomorrow. He seems like a nice guy. Completely trustworthy, probably. From there, Elizabeth, coached by Booker on the radio, sets out to redeem herself while the story sets out to fill in some gaps in the Bioshock lore. It revisits characters from Bioshock Infinite and draws parallels between Rapture and Columbia, such as between Fink, the industrialist who built Songbird, and Su Chong, the scientist who created Big Daddies. I think we found our man. No sign of him now. It feels a bit like peeking behind the curtain of Bioshock 1 before its protagonist Jack steps on the scene. Where the first episode of Burial at Sea took place in the Art Deco opulence of pre-fall rapture, this act is a lot darker and damper and closer to the original Bioshock game by making Liz a forensic explorer in the ruins. You'll also spend a lot of time crouching to stay hidden so your view will often be of waist-high counters and broken glass on the floor. God help you if you step on any of that. Come here, hon. Got a sweet idea for you. But playing as Elizabeth this time refreshes the Bioshock experience, partly with the new MO of basic stealth, but mostly for the opportunity to spend time inside her head after spending so much time inside Booker's. She's a likeable, sympathetic protagonist, casting the ruthless, debt-collecting Liz of Burial at Sea Episode 1 in a new light. You're my only friend. By dabbling with time travel as well as the interdimensional kind, Burial at Sea ties up some Bioshock Infinite loose ends with some Bioshock loose ends, binding the two games and their two cities together closer than you might expect. It's an intriguing epilogue, though it deals in cycles of inevitability, more than mind-bending revelations that Elizabeth is her own grandmother, or what have you. I will never escape it. Exploited, exploited. It's like a wheel of blood spinning round and round. It's still a suitable send-off for Irrational Games, with the studio as we knew it closing down, now Barry Let's See is out the door. That is, a satisfying tale of the two cities that defined it as a developer. Well, three cities if you count Paris. Now there's an idea, setting a game in Paris. So he thinks it's going to be set in feudal Japan. What? Didn't he see Notre Dame? Right? Yeah, it's clearly set in Aztec era Mesoamerica. Ah, OK. Well, speaking of irrational conclusions, have you heard that Irrational is shutting down after Bioshock Infinite Burial at Sea? I did, actually, Jane. I'm uh, something of an irrational historian myself. I noticed. No, I meant the company. You might think you know everything about Bioshock creator Irrational Games, from what product Ken Levine uses to keep his beard looking so shiny and lustrous, to where Ken Levine shops for his ironically cool vintage X-Men t-shirts. You might even know Ken Levine's phone number and whether he's free tomorrow night, in which case, DM us on Twitter. But you probably don't know these five things about Irrational Games. First up, they made a Bollywood game. Well, 
Sort of. The game in question, The Lost, was originally going to be Irrational's first console game, released on PS2 and based on Dante's Inferno. The poem, not EA's game. Hate that we have to make that distinction. Amid budget cuts and quality concerns, the game was cancelled in a very nearly finished state. There was even box art produced for it, it was that close. The remains were sold to an Indian studio called FX Labs who reworked and redubbed it to appeal to a local audience. The result is a game called Agni, Queen of Darkness, which is entirely in Hindi and was promoted in a music video by legit Bollywood superstar Malaika Arora. Somehow, in between making all those great games, Irrational also made a podcast that would put most editorial outlets to shame. Though, not ours, if we ever did one, obviously. This show is about conversation. Conversations with interesting, creative people, creative, talented people. Talented people. The main draw was the calibre of guest. Not only were personalities from the world of gaming, like Cliffy B, happy to come along and chew the fat, but Irrational managed to bag famous types from Hollywood too. And then dealing with the gaming press is its own art form. You can't give them bull, but at the same time, you can't give them the corporate line. The creative genius behind Pan's Labyrinth, Guillermo del Toro, swung by for a particularly enlightening two-part chat, and the creative uh, man behind Sucker Punch, Zack Snyder, turned up too. We don't design a monster as a function. We design characters. And I think there's a huge difference between a monster and a character that is a monster. Best of all, they're still available on irrationalgames.com for now. Get them while you can. Stop us if this sounds familiar, post-apocalyptic zombie horror in a ruined city married to four-player co-op. As it happens, just as Turtle Rock was starting development on Left 4 Dead over on the west coast, on the east Irrational were prototyping Division 9, which as you can see looks very similar indeed. God damn it! Incoming. It's likely that Irrational would have had a head start though. Eagle-eyed viewers will recognise this level is based on the Victory Import Auto Center mission from the brilliant and totally underappreciated SWAT 4. The game was originally envisioned as a supernatural spin-off from the SWAT series called SWAT Special Division, but Vivendi passed on it because it was a bit too crazy. Still, if that game had happened, perhaps we wouldn't have gotten Bioshock in 2007. Swings and roundabouts, right? One of Irrational's most influential employees was Jordan Thomas, who created not one, but two of the scariest levels in video gaming history. You'll remember Fort Frolic from the first Bioshock game as the haunting home of maniacal showman Sander Cohen. Thomas was the primary level designer and, based on the strength of his work, was asked by Levine to do a pass on the entire game, making it more creepy. What you might not know is that Thomas was also in charge of Thief Deadly Shadow's infamous Shalebridge Cradle level back in 2004, which is considered quintessential video gaming horror and is absolutely the inspiration for the Asylum level in the new Thief game. He's now working on a soon-to-be-announced indie game which we'll be playing with all the lights on, just as a precaution. Deep Cover was one of Irrational's earliest projects, working in tandem with Levine's old studio, Looking Glass Studios. It was planned to be a 1960s Cold War spy thriller, which was described by a former employee as having the elegance of Thief and the depth of System Shock 2. When Looking Glass finally closed in 2000, the project was canned. Still, probably got closer than Rockstar's a bit too elusive agent ever did to release. Sorry PlayStation fans, couldn't resist that one. Now it's time to see what you said to us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and suggesting to Andy in his Netflix recommendations. It's just a load of history documentaries. I didn't put these here. I better delete them. That's worth a shot. First up, the comments on last week's show about Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes and the fine art of video game stealth. <laughs> Vincent A has another stealthy pro tip for us. He says, You forgot about the intense stealth action in Rockstar's Bully. Jumping in a trash can, sometimes even in plain sight of an enemy, and you're hidden for life. Yeah, I wondered what that smell was. Yeah, he didn't mention that in his comment. I might just stick to boxes in future. Meanwhile, my team man 70 says, I was hiding in the box on the shelf in the props room. He could be anywhere by now. I think I heard something banging around in the ventilation ducts. Well, good luck to him. Finally, it looks like I might be in for a lucrative career change. The Average Max says, I would like to see Andy as an alternate character in Phantom Pain. His stealth skills are unmatched. While Ben Lipson comments, I reckon Andy has the potential to be the next protagonist of Metal Gear Solid. He has a box as well as double. That's all you need. Call me, coach. Also last week, we profiled the worst doctors in video games. I bring my own eye patch. When you go to the doctor, you expect to feel better afterwards. Having played video games, however, I can see why many video game characters choose to heal themselves. 
A few of you had doctor suggestions of your own, including Gareth Merrifield, who says, Dr. Robotnik, instead of doing what he did to earn his doctorate, he is endlessly chasing a nippy blue hedgehog. What did Robotnik do to earn his doctorate? Mm, theoretical mustache physics. It's a great loss to his profession. Gareth Vicarian, meanwhile, takes time out of his busy schedule of standing around the Normandy engine room to say, what about Dr. Traeger from Outlast? You know, the guy who sp and sp you with a sp Censored for spoilers there. We're too kind. Lastly, Max Donovan says, Why you forget Dr. Zed, Borderlands? Son, this might sting a bit. All good suggestions. Maybe just have a lemon sip, see if you get better on your own. Finally, the comments on the Assassin's Creed Unity trailer and its mysterious, unknowable setting. <laughs> Abe Grand is disappointed, saying, Why only next gen? The reason for that, Abe Grand, is because Ubisoft are bringing out two Assassin's Creed games this year. Unity, the one we see here, is being developed specifically for next gen consoles, while another title, codenamed Comet, is being developed for current gen. Last gen. Whatever we're calling it now. Expect more details on that as well coming soon. Jaden Swift is in a mood meanwhile, saying, Done f it up, Ubisoft. I'm sick of the European bull. We need ninjas. Also, God help me, I will air assassinate you. European bull. The last three Assassin's Creed games have been set in order in the West Indies, America, and America. Yeah, you sick of it though, Andy? Well, less angry, although still a bit angry, is Mr. Xenobro, who emerges from his alien frat house to say, I'm excited, but cut the subtitles, Ubisoft. Just number them for Christ's sake. Finally, Game Glider has the plot sussed already. I'm gonna say it, he's definitely gonna have to stop someone from getting the guillotine. Ah, put your house on it. Right, I'm off, catch you in a bit. It'd be just like stopping someone from getting hanged in Black Flag. Okay. You just shoot the rope. Guillotines don't work like that. Think I know a little something about how guillotines work. Jane. Oh, she's gone. That's it for Show of the Week, but between now and next time, drop us a line on Twitter or Facebook.com slash OutsideXbox and say hi. And if you liked it, good, uh, drop us a like and a subscribe and you'll never miss a video. See you next time. Yeah, see, those curtains, clearly Imperial China. Of course. Nailed it. Nailed it.